And uh, so welcome to the next session. It's a, it's a great pleasure and a great honor for me, a privilege to introduce the first speaker this morning, Professor Ed Efros from UCLA, who will speak on some remarkable gems and persistent difficulties in quantized functional analysis. Merci. I want to thank the organizers. Uh, I have to say that I was not aware of uh, the area of information theory, how much it was interacting with uh, uh, my favorite area, which is quantized functional analysis. So um, I have a lot of learning to do, and uh, uh, I might not talk, I might make mistakes if I start mentioning the um, information theory applications, but I'll just go ahead and. Uh, from my uh, graduate education uh, days, I. Uh, have always been interested in dual spaces. And I was a student of George Mackey, who uh, uh, introduced the and used the notion of the dual of a uh, locally compact group G. And G hat is the set of all irreducible Hilbert space. representations of G. We'll assume that uh, this second is metrizable, say. And this is with a, for simplicity, uh, we'll assume that our Hilbert space is, is separable. I'm sure you're all familiar with the use of uh, the dual of uh, a locally compact group for a commutative group. Uh, and that's sort of the uh, underlying framework for Fourier analysis. And um, what Mackey was, in, uh, was showing was that uh, even if the group is not abelian, it's a very useful uh, notion. One thing I should say about G roof is initially it's just a set, a set of unitary representations of G irreducible. This again here is a, a separable Hilbert space. And um, if your G is abelian, um, well, let me, uh, if your G is abelian, then you have that G roof is just the dual group. So the natural question is um, how much structure does that dual group have? And in the case of an abelian group, um, it, it is a, a faithful uh, functor. That is, uh, anything you want to know about G is sort of encoded in G roof. What's more interesting and more relevant for our purposes is the notion of what you do when your G is not abelian. That's what uh, Mackey was uh, specifically studying. And um, when I was his student, I got very interested in uh, his theory of uh, finding all the representations of a group as integrals of rep irreducible representations. And therefore, you had an integral over the space G roof of irreducible representations. To have such an integral, you had to have a notion of a Borel set. And um, uh, Mackey was able to use that uh, in his decomposition of representations into irreducible representations, especially if the group was a smooth or type one, as it's called. And um, the, the, the discussion I got in with Mackey was that this was actually uh, a, a very important object in itself. I said that if you study groups, you should also study uh, their duals. They, they're just as important as the original groups and that you should be studying uh, uh, these more general structures. He, he disagreed with me. He said that uh, the dual is just an index space, and um, uh, one shouldn't spend too much time on it. And he said, but let's talk about it in a week. And unfortunately, that was the week in which he passed away. And um, so I never got to have that discussion with him. But I've tried to, uh, or I tried to, 
uh, continue that uh, pursuit. And uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, uh, generalized spaces, index spaces, and the, uh, their Borel or topological structures actually are, is a very rich uh, topic. So let me write down the uh, relevant notions of uh, quantized uh, functional analysis that you have to use for this. And um, to begin with, we have um, As I said, we have, if G is a group, we have its notion of a, a unitary, separable. We look at the set of representations, irreducible representations. And my claim is this object encodes, even if G is non-commutative, and even if G is non-smooth, in some sense, this encodes all the information about G. Now, I mean, you're all familiar with the fact that uh, instead of studying a group G, you can study its group algebra, and uh, that's, how you, that's how I'll probably um, approach this. A is the, uh, uh, the, the group C star algebra of G. Okay, now let me uh, continue from there. The first thing I should point out is that uh, uh, we're replacing l linear combinations of group elements by um, C of G roof, where G roof consists of irreducible representations. And uh, you'll recall that the title of this talk is uh, various uh, gems and various obstructions that uh, bedevil people in the area. The gems are really quite beautiful, some of them and uh, the first one is due to uh, a glim. Who uh, showed that uh, um, G is type one. You have uh, the C star algebra of G. is um, type one if and only if, okay, let's look at this. G is type one. That means that all the representations are type one, von Neumann algebras. Gen all representations generate type one von Neumann algebras. So, um, and the theorem states that G is type one if and only if the dual is smooth. You have to put an additional condition. G has to be, uh, let's say, second countable. I, I don't care about these specific uh, details of that. And um, that was what made me so interested in the duals of groups. And the dual of a group, if it's not commutative, won't be a group anymore, but it will still have a uh, Borel structure and it will still have um, a notion of uh, topology on it. So that would be my, my gem number one. Yes. Now the second uh, gem has to do with the um, fact that um, has to do with the fact that uh, um, the um, 
Yes. The pre duel of any um, uh, von Neumann algebra is locally reflexive. I think this began with Marius Junge, uh, the first case of this, but then it turned out to be true in a complete generality. This shows you that um, there's something to be said about looking at the um, metric linear structure of the uh, pre dual. You see, the question is the pre dual isn't a, uh, of a group, or the dual of a group is not a uh, group anymore, so you have to introduce appropriate invariance. And the, uh, uh, one of the most important invariants is this notion of being locally reflexive. Now, this is an example of where you have to now really change your framework and start thinking in terms of um, uh, how you handle Bonnock algebras, introduce those notions for Bonnock algebras, like local reflexivity. Nuclearity. So that's my gem number two. And the definition is very similar to that for uh, Bonnock spaces. And in fact, what you're looking at here now are quantized Bonnock spaces. If you have a linear space of uh, operators, uh, you can think of that as a generalized form of a linear of a space of functions, and um, um, so we we have that um, uh, uh, there are a number of different definitions for local reflexive in the case of uh, operator spaces. So this brings us to linear spaces of operators. Which is sort of the analog of linear spaces of functions. I'm sure you're all familiar with the um, quantization of, uh, that occurs at many different levels in mathematics, in which you replace um, functions by operators. And uh, physically, of course, it just, you think of the operator as a leader, like this. And uh, if you have just one operator, um, it, it's essentially the same as a classical notion of a function. This is the range of the function over here. And uh, then, um, uh, it's th then so, so the uh, linear spaces of uh, uh, functions, the, the relevant structure is a Bonnock space or a Bonnock algebra. Whereas over here, or a Bonnock space, I'm just interested in the norm structure. Whereas over here, you have to do a more elaborate notion of the operator space. So this brings us to another favorite topic that I've looked at over the years, a notion of an operator space is um, simply a linear, well, first of all, what's a Bonnock space? You can think of it just as a linear subspace of, of some L infinity of uh, a set. Whereas an operator space is a linear subspace of the bounded operators on some Hilbert space H. But here, the structure is quite different. This thing over here, the structure is you have a norm. Whereas over here, if, you have a, if you're given a subspace of B of H, then you have a matrix norm. So in this situation, you have that if V is contained in B of H, then MN of V is contained in MN of B of H which you can think of as B of HN. So this has an additional norm. 
the matrices have a canonical norm. Canonical norms, yes. Canonical norm. So we're in now in the um, category of um, what are called operator spaces. And um, an operator space is something which has um, not a single norm, but an infinite, a family of norms on the n by n matrices. So one can then ask, um, so then what, uh, let me now tell you about this, the second, what gem am I up to, gem number, well number two, this notion over here being locally reflexive, this is locally reflexive in the sense of, op of operator spaces. So, The notion of locally reflex was first introduced for Banach spaces, and subsequently it was, it was not difficult to show that there was a corresponding notion for operator spaces. And what was intriguing about this is that um, this is the pre dual of a von Neumann algebra. In the commutative case, you would be looking at the pre dual of L1 uh, of a, of a Commutative, in the commutative case, you would be looking at pre dual of this thing over here, which would be L1 of x mu. So we, um, this makes it meaningful to say that the pre dual. Of, uh, of von Neumann algebra is um, uh, locally reflexive. Um, let me write that down again. That that is going to be our. Here it is over here. Is locally reflexive in the operator space sense. Then we have to look at the more general um, functional analytic constructions. Um, for Banach spaces, and uh, probably the next one to look at is the um, weak extension property. And here's where we really get into the mysteries of the subject. Um, let me write down the definition of locally reflexive, incidentally, for operator spaces. And that simply says that if you have a um, um, completely bounded mapping from F into the second dual of an operator space, these are operator spaces, then that's approximated by mappings phi lambda from F into V. That's our notion. And that's the same notion that you would see in the case of Bollock spaces. And this can be written, the fact that this is true, if this is true, is equivalent to saying that a certain tensor product equation holds. Namely, so this is a, you could first think of it for Bollock spaces, and it says that if you take the dual of F star, this equation holds. So this is F finite dimensional. So F is finite dimensional. Then this thing over here is equal to F tensor of V star. With the appropriate norms, and I won't go through the whole theory of that, but the theory is exactly the same, at least in the definitions, as the Bonnock space theory. So our next gem, um, now this is, this, is, this, was, this is what I'm talking about over here, is that 
the pre-dual of any von Neumann algebra is locally reflexive. So it's, this is your analog of your L1 space. So it's saying that all L1 spaces are in the operator spaces. If you go over to the non-commutative version of this, it's automatically locally reflexive. That's another gem, very beautiful result in the subject. Let me write down some more uh, information. We say that um, the von Neumann algebra R is, um, has the, the QWEP if it is a quotient this isn't going to be very instructive of a uh, uh, Neumann algebra with the WEP. This is called the weak extension property and it's a technical result but it's analogous to what goes on in Bollock spaces. And uh, so our next gem is that gem number three says that uh, um, yes, it says that a von Neumann algebra R has the QWEP, whatever that means, um, if and only if uh, that, let me just write this as an implication, implies that R lower star is approximated by subspaces of tri uh, finite dimensional operator spaces. And now we come to our first major problem. And I think it's probably, many people would say, it's the uh, most important unsolved problem in operator algebras. And that's the question of whether do all C star algebras have this property? Or rather, do all von Neumann algebras There's the corresponding notion for C star algebras have the property QWEP. Now, um, before, let me put this in a different way. We have that um, having this QWEP can be stated um, uh, let me use the C star algebra version of it. We have that uh, uh, for, yes, for the free groups, we have this a fundamental formula that says this. So again, even though you might not know the uh, operator space definitions here, um, you can go back to the Bonnock space uh, version, and it, you'll immediately um, this is one of the most beautiful theorems in the subject, and I should tell you who uh, first proved it. Does anybody know? Kirchberg. Kirchberg. Yeah, yes, of course. Is he here? Is Kirschberg here today? No. Good. <laughs> okay. I shouldn't have forgotten that. Here's another. Uh, so this is a. This is, as I say, a fundamental problem. One of the reasons it's fundamental is because it's equivalent to 
Now, that's not a problem. This is true. But this one over here is uh, equivalent to uh, uh, many other results, like the Kahn embedding problem. It also plays a, an important role in information theory. And um, now let me write down one more uh, uh, gem. First of all, a C star algebra is nuclear. if and only if um, the second dual is injected. That's an old theorem of the subject. The remarkable gem is that this is false for operator spaces. So you have to know the definition of nuclear. Just to remind you, it looks something like this. You can get approximations of the identity like this. And um, this equivalence is false in general. But uh, recently, uh, uh, as my last gem to mention, I'm even losing count, count of the number of gems. And that states, this is a theorem of uh, Dong and Teo. It's false for operator spaces, but they proved that um, uh, if you have any operator space V, we have that uh, uh, the dual is nuclear if and only if um, the second dual is injected. I'm sorry, the, the second dual of this is injected which is quite a surprise. Well, you'll have to forgive my um, jet lag, which seems to have continued into today as well. But um, this will give you a slight feeling, perhaps, of some of the uh, central problems of uh, quantized functional analysis. There are many beautiful theorems in the subject, but there are also very, very difficult problems which uh, everybody would like to solve. So I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to me. and. Uh, uh, for inviting me to this conference. Thank you very much. Uh, are there uh, questions or, or comments? We uh, do have time for that. Or maybe associations with other ideas or suggestions of, for other gems or <laughs> difficulties you'd like to point out? Yes, please. Well, uh, of refills. Yes. It's very beautiful work, but I haven't had time to really master that. But it looks like it's the correct uh, approach. Yeah, the question was about quantum metric spaces, Riefel's theory. Any other suggestions or comments or? Well, perhaps not. Thank you very Thank much you. again. Yeah. Thank you.